on power, privilege and data, how we map and what we miss. Russia. Thank you everyone. I'm a bit shorter than everyone. Um, and I have also worked with David Bruce. <laughs> so um, if we could please um, just shuffle to the first slide. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. So, hello, friends, colleagues. Ram Ram to you all from my heritage as a Fiji Indian. Hello, as a proud Australian. Budi Ira Kamaru from the local people where I hail in Sydney. Kia ora from the land that I was born in. And Nina Warni, Manni, from the language of the local people here. Today, I'd like to speak with you about power, privilege, and data. How we map and what we miss. I'm sure that as geospatial professionals, all of us are familiar with this map. John Snow, 1854, cholera. However, 200 years on, there are some problems which we haven't been able to solve effectively at all. Take a case study in the late 60s of where commuters would routinely run over black children, killing them in Detroit. Almost 200 years later on, some street corners would suffer from one child dying per month. An unlikely alliance eventually formed between the black young adults from downtown Detroit and academics from surrounding neighborhoods who put together this map. In the end, they were able to produce a series of comprehensive reports covering topics such as social and economic inequities among neighbourhood children and proposals for new, more racially equitable school district boundaries. But contrast this map to this one. This was made almost 30 years earlier by the Residential Security Board, uh, sorry, by the Detroit Board of Commerce, which consisted of only white men in collaboration with the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, which again consisted of white men. Both maps are straightforward using cartographic techniques, an aerial view, legends, keys, but the similarities end there. The maps differ in terms of visual style, but more profoundly is how they diverge in terms of the world views of their makers and the communities that they seek to support. This map was one of the earliest instances of the practice of redlining, a term used to describe how banks rated the risk of granting loans to potential homeowners on the basis of neighbourhood demographics, specifically race and ethnicity, rather than the individual's creditworthiness. Redlining gets its name because the practice first occurred by literally drawing red lines on maps. You can see here, that many of the instances of the black um, neighbourhoods occur in the red areas that we can see here. All of Detroit's black neighbourhoods fall into these red areas because housing uh, discrimination and other forms of structural oppression predated this practice of mapping. But by denying home loans to the people who lived in these neighbourhoods, it only reinforces the ex existing inequalities as decades of research have shown. Um, so take a moment to stop and consider these two maps. The differences in how they were made, how they were used, and the impact that they had on shaping their corner of the world. We can see that systems of power in society do translate into the data that we create. As no doubt many of you are aware, megatrends can be used to explore the global forces shaping our world, and these forces are shaping our industry too. Rapid urbanization, climate change, resource scarcity, shifts in global economic power distribution, demographics and social change, and technological innovations. 
These are challenges as well as opportunities. When people from privileged dominant groups create most of our data products, the result is not only that we end up with data sets that are biased or underrepresented. The truth gets reproduced time and time again based on what we create as data. An even more catastrophic and dangerous outcome is that some data does not get collected at all. Maybe Mimi Onuha is a custodian of the Library of Missing Datasets, which is an archive on GitHub of the datasets which are reasonably expected to exist but don't. The problems that these datasets call for, they do exist and are acknowledged, but the datasets which would help us to conceptualise and analyse and resolve them have been missed. And this list is growing today. I'd now like to explore the case of how gender-related unconscious bias of volunteer group geographic information mappers, in this case, OpenStreetMaps, in 2013, shaped a data set that is widely used and endlessly replicated today. Some of you may have read the research paper by Das et al. 2019 on this, or heard the fantastic GeoRevel presentation given by my friend Mina. At least four academic studies have shown that in 2013, a staggering 95 to 98% of all contributions to OSM were produced by men who are predominantly young and technologically abled. We might notice that there are several groups who are not included within the general OSM mapper. Women are an obvious one, as are the elderly and the socioeconomically disadvantaged. Less obvious are people with disabilities, First Nations people, people of colour or from diverse cultural and religious backgrounds, people from various socioeconomic backgrounds who may not have access to technology, and the list goes on. Gardner et al. 2020 focused their research on exploring gender differences in editing and tagging preferences. They found established research showing that women of all ages tend to be disproportionately bearing the responsibilities for childbearing and household care, leaving less time for education and work, let alone volunteer geographic information. Add to this that there is still an existing global stigma for girls undertaking STEM activities, which, while shifting, especially in the global north, is still a point of stigma in the ways which many girls are able to spend their time. Within technology, there tend to be many less women than men at all levels. A 2023 McKinsey report revealed that women make up 37% of entry-level roles, while only 25% of senior management roles. There are 52 women being promoted to manager for every 100 men. It's important to note that the situation with OpenStreetMaps has obviously shifted since 2013. They have paid attention and they've changed their practices and processes. However, this case study makes a notable point that many of us, by way of our unconscious biases, come up against in the geospatial work that we do every day and the data that we create on a daily basis. When geospatial information is created by a group who are uniform in their identities, ways of thinking and ways of doing, we run the risk that they will simply miss out on including things into the data that they do not feel are necessarily relevant or important to them as a demographic group. The credibility and scope of the data is undermined and its use is constrained. This unconscious bias is not a value judgment on other people or groups. It is a function of the way that the human brain works. However, this has the undesirable and potentially highly damaging result that particular demographics, people or places, will become hidden, invisible or lost as a result. And it is these implications which have serious, even lethal consequences that over time can accumulate to be disastrous. As geospatial professionals, whether we are downstream or upstream, working in land, mining or engineering surveying, hydrography, cartography, earth observation, data analytics, we are gatekeepers of knowledge. The data that we create, use, modify and augment gives us power. And this comes with responsibility for capturing the physical world into the digital world well, for how we do this is subjective, influenced by our unconscious biases, and these subjective versions of the world will be endlessly 
re replicated. Isn't that something? Oftentimes, when we map, we miss representation of voices who are not represented in our workforce. We've no doubt all read the several papers on workforce that have been released over the years, the latest being the brilliant surveying trust report written by Danikara a couple of months ago, and in South Australia, no doubt you know of the work that Michael Nitschke is doing. We all know of the skills shortages our industry is facing, the challenges in getting new people into our businesses, retaining talent, retaining talent, and because of this, our productivity is bottlenecked. Our charge out rates and salaries are too low. Our value to society is ubiquitous, but also more invisible than it should be. If we don't stem the skills shortage, and if we don't increase representation of people from all parts of society into our industry, there is a lot to lose. This doesn't just impact us in Australia, but also all around the world. First Nations people in Canada, America, and more recently New Zealand and now Australia are routinely and systematically underrepresented in our industry. Their knowledges are also underrepresented in the data that we create. Data about Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander people in Australia tends often to be to describe them as, or we describe this as batter data. It often starkly contrasts Indigenous people in a binary against non-Indigenous people, blaming them by showcasing their shortcomings and failings. Shorter lifespans, greater incidences of addiction, crime, the list goes on. The data is often aggregated and decontextualised and at scales that are not accessible to the world view of First Nations people, which is highly local and rich in geography and topology. It is often provided on the context of government priorities, which are not necessarily the priorities of these communities and peoples, still with a very colonial approach through lack of inclusion and co-design, through unconscious biases and under-representation in those creating the data, and it's often created and stored in a way that's not accessible to First Nations people. This, of course, does not only apply to First Nations people only. People with visible and in invisible disabilities, survivors of domestic violence, there are many other demographics who face similar challenges, but that is not to minimise these challenges or the flow on impacts of how societal forces of power and privilege fall into the data that we produce about them. New Zealand is progressive in having an algorithmic charter, acknowledging that data is increasingly being used to automate and semi-automate decision-making in many spheres. Embedded within this is the need for embedding a Te Māori perspective in the development and use of algorithms, consistent with the principles of the Waitangi Treaty, and a focus on identifying and actively engaging with people, communities, and groups who have an interest in and are impacted by the use of algorithms. There is also a clear focus on understanding limitations and understanding and managing bias in algorithms. The Mayam Niari Wingara People Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective at the inaugural Indigenous Data Sovereignty Summit in 2018 developed an Australian set of Indigenous data governance protocols and principles. It is supported by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and seeks to recognise that participation, partnership and decision making applies across the entire ecosystem of data to create data for governance and governance for data. And this applies to us as geospatial professionals as well. As you know, our industry has been evolving in recent years in the last decade, we have been part of a digital revolution that has facilitated automation and semi-automation of data-driven decision-making across many sectors. Our data often forms the foundation of this, whether it's in digital twins, automated valuation models, natural disaster response and recovery, or a rapidly growing suite of many other applications. In the October 2018 budget, the UK Chancellor announced that the UK Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation would investigate the potential bias in decision making by algorithms for the UK government, and this report was released in late 2020. They aimed to provide advice for regulators and industry to support responsible innovation and help build a strong, trustworthy system of governance. We need one of these reports here too. Algorithms are structured processes which have long been used to aid human decision-making. 
Developments in machine learning techniques and an exponential growth in the availability of data have allowed for more sophisticated algorithm development. Algorithms often do not represent the complete decision-making process. It's humans who decide what the objectives are and what data is available and how the output will be used. Organisations and their leaders are responsible for the decisions whether these have been made by an algorithm or a team of humans. This study had, for, had, had a focus on decisions where potential bias seems to represent a significant and in, imminent ethical risk, where algorithms have the potential to make or inform a significant decision that directly affects an individual human being, where algorithmic decision making is being used now or likely soon will be, where algorithmic decision making changes ethical risks, and where decisions are potentially biased rather than other forms of unfairness, such as arbitrariness or unreasonableness. <coughs> Pardon me. The key themes here were data. Do organisations and regulators have access to the data that they require to adequately identify and mitigate bias? Tools and techniques. What statistical and technical solutions are available now or will be required in the future to identify and mitigate bias and which represents best practice? And governance. Who should be responsible for governing, auditing and assuring these algorithmic decision-making systems? In Australia, we need to decide these things too. They looked at four different sectors. Sectors involved in making decisions at scale about individuals which involve significant potential impacts on those individuals' lives, which have growing interest in the use of algorithmic decision-making tools, including machine learning. Sectors which have evidence of historic bias in decision-making, leading to risks of this being perpetuated by the introduction of algorithms. And so these four sectors are policing, financial services, recruitment, and local government. The growth in algorithmic decision-making has been accompanied by significant concerns about bias, that the use of algorithms can cause a systematic skew in decision-making that results in unfair outcomes. There is clear evidence that algorithmic bias can occur, whether through entrenching previous human biases or introducing new ones. Fairness is about much more than the absence of bias. Fair decisions need also to be non-arbitrary, reasonable, consider equality implications, and respect the circumstances and personal agency of individuals. There are multiple concepts of fairness, some of which are incompatible and can be incompat yeah, incompatible and can be ambiguous. In human decisions, we can often accept ambiguity and allow human judgment to consider complex reasons. However, when it comes to decision making in algorithms, they are unambiguous. We cannot separate the question of algorithmic bias from the question of fair decision making more broadly. It is important that the overall decision making process is fair, not merely that the algorithms are unbiased. Good use of data can identify where bias is occurring, helping us investigate why and measure whether our efforts to combat it are effective. However, data can also make things worse. New forms of data-driven decision-making have surfaced numerous examples where algorithms have entrenched or amplified historic biases or even created new forms of bias. This highlights the urgent need for the world to do better in using algorithms in the right way, to promote fairness, not undermine it. We now have the opportunity to adopt a more rigorous, proactive approach to identifying and mitigating bias in key areas of life. Fairness through unawareness is often not enough to prevent bias. There are plenty of fairness issues with human decision making, but some of the challenges with algorithms are different. Organisations often rely on human decision makers to interpret guidance appropriately and apply human judgment when required, especially in unusual cases. An algorithm can't do this. It will optimise against an objective without balance if told to do so. Despite concerns about black box algorithms, in some ways algorithms can be more transparent than human decision making. 
Unlike human decision making, with its algorithms, it's best possible. Sorry, with algorithms, it's a possible. It's possible to test a system's response to changing inputs, even though the underlying logic can sometimes be opaque for both humans and machine learning algorithms. Algorithms are also consistent. This can be a good thing, but it's also a risk. A single biased human can only make so many biased decisions, whereas bias embedded in algorithms can scale exponentially. What we include and what we miss is a direct result of the power and privileges that we hold as individuals, and these shape our unconscious biases individually, at a society level, and even in the organisations that we work in. I'd now like to ground us a little bit in some of the meanings of the words that I've been mentioning today. Diversity, as I'm sure you're all familiar, is the amount of sameness within the composition of a group. It's a quantitative measure. It involves factors that are visible and invisible, and there is a concept called intersectionality, which is where you can't separate your race from your age, your age from your gender, your gender from any other aspect of your individual identity. If we look at inclusion, we can see that inclusion is the activation of diversity. It's a qualitative measure, it's subjective. When done right, inclusion leads to psychological safety. Psychological safety is when you feel able to take interpersonal risks. You can fail and it will be okay. You can voice things that other people may not like, and that will also be okay. This is critical. In fact, it is the foundation of innovation. When you have innovation, it creates a sense of belonging, where people feel like they're part of something bigger and they're working towards something that's meaningful. As the famous quote says, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance and belonging is dancing like no one's watching. Power is your ability to have agency, to influence. Privilege is the accumulation of power or access to power as a result of the identity factors, both visible and invisible, that we all hold. Unconscious bias is almost a result of power and privilege. And these will interact on many levels, interrelated over space and time. Again, individual levels, organisational levels, and systemic levels. This quote by Emma Cox displays this really well. For example, I, as a white person, often feel entitled to be recognised when I enter a room because society constantly reinforces the idea that I am welcome and deserving of attention in any space and that my needs are top priority. This is how I benefit from racism. However, I also identify and am perceived as a cisgender woman and being a woman has taught me to be quiet and meek when I enter a room, which transforms into internalised oppression. As we move through life, we each get different messages about how we and those around us, whether similar or different, can expect to be treated. This brings us to the concepts of equity versus equality. Equality is something that we are all very good at. It's giving everyone the same chance, regardless of their need. Equity, however, is a slightly different concept, and this involves giving people different levels of support or opportunity depending on their need. Take the example that we have in the picture here. Equality means that everyone gets a wooden box to stand on. When we look at the equity side of things, you can see that people who want to look over the fence and see the sports game of some description that's happening there, um, they're able to get the need, get the support that they need based on the individual level of need. So now I'm going to try a exercise. I'd like you all to get out your phones and go to www.menti.com and use the code written on the screen, 63451786. I'll give you a minute to get started and then we're going to do an exercise.
Oh, not yet, sorry. Thank you. So I'm going to read out a series of statements. I want you to start on the number 30. And if the statement applies to you, then add one. 30 to 31, 31 to 32. If the statement does not apply to you, subtract one. 32 to 31, 31 to 30, 30 to 29. All right. If you haven't got the mentee on, on your phone, um, you can do that in a second because from experience, counting up and down while working through this exercise can be a little confusing, so it's best to focus on that. So, starting at 30. Number one, English is your first language. Plus one or minus one. Two, either or both of your parents graduated from tertiary education. Plus one or minus one. Three, work or school holidays coincide with religious holidays that you or your family celebrate. Plus one or minus one. Four, you're an Australian citizen. Five, you do not have visible or invisible disabilities. You did not grow up in a rural setting. You have not been bullied or made fun of based on something you cannot change about yourself. You have not been in a situation where you felt uncomfortable about a joke or statement that related to part of your identity but you felt unsafe to confront the situation. You are Caucasian. You have blonde or brown hair. You are male. You studied the culture or history of your ancestors during school. You have not been in a situation where you felt unsafe walking alone at night. You have never had an eating disorder. You have never experienced a mental illness. You almost always see members of your race, sexual orientation, religion and class widely represented in the media in a positive or more moral light. If you were to walk into a business and ask to speak to the person in charge, you would likely see someone who looks like you. You almost always feel comfortable with people knowing your sexual orientation. You or a loved one have never experienced alcohol or drug addiction. You have never been the only person of your race in a classroom or place of work. You have never been mistreated because of how you look. Children's toys tend to represent your skin colour. You have never been hesitant to speak to avoid being ridiculed because of your accent. Raising your voice or putting forward an assertive stance makes you perceived as confident rather than aggressive. You get due recognition for the work that you do in the workplace. You have one or more mentors who looks like you do. You don't regularly be you don't regularly experience being talked over in meetings. You have never been sexually objectified in the workplace. So remember the number that you have now in your head. Go to www.menti.com and use the code 63451786 and type in that number now. While you're doing that, I'd like to talk about how we can miss less and how we map. There is hope. 
If you would like some further reading, here's a collection of books that I found useful to help me learn about all of these materials. What can we do about societal inequ inequity impacting how we map? So, the case studies that I've run through with you today highlight systemic oppression based on the cumulative effects of our unconscious bias flowing into how we are gatekeepers of knowledge and the effects of power and privilege both within the way that they're perpetuated in society but also the ways in which they're brought to life in the data that we create, manage and map as geospatial professionals. There's no doubt that instances in each of our careers as professionals where we have made where we have either created or represented data in a particular way to provide a specific message. Indeed, this is part and parcel of the art of cartography. If you've ever made a thematic map, chances are you've used data to tell a story that reveals to some extent, minor or major, an unconscious bias that you hold. A reflection of the power and privileges that we as custodians and, crea of crea and creators of da data hold, which both captures and misses elements of the world around us. So here are some things that we can do. Number one, collect. Be aware of missing data or missing elements of data and work to collect it. Number two, analyze. Explore the data sets that you create or come across to consider how they capture inequity or inequality across both individuals and groups to facilitate accountability through data. Number three, imagine. Aim higher in the standards that you set for who collects data, why, how the data is stored and accessed, and what else can be done with the data. Consider your data as a tool for liberation. Number four, teach. Tell your story. Inspire a love of geospatial and surveying to the people of all types to encourage them to come into the profession and stay in the profession. Ultimately, we need to inspire as much diversity and inclusion in our industry as possible to shift the harmful legacies of historical lack of diversity without losing our previous and valued heritage. Our industry is valuable, it's beautiful, powerful and filled to the brim with potential. Let's get people of all types everywhere to be excited to be part of it. While we are all busy people with a lot of work to do, cultivating curiosity is part of having a growth mindset, an often encouraged attitude in many workplaces today. Paired with non-judgment, as every single person on this planet has unconscious biases at no fault of their own, as a result of simply being human, curiosity can be a powerful way to notice what we have favoured or what's missing. These converge to create awareness, which is enhanced by reflection, and together these empower us to challenge unconscious biases within ourselves and the way we work in our teams and organisations. The power and privileges that we hold as individuals and groups creating data will become embedded into the data we create. The things that we notice, the things we deem important to make a note of, and the things that we deem unimportant in designing information systems, the languages that we use, even how we collaborate with others to create the geospatial practices, processes and technologies of the future. What we include and what we miss is a direct result of the power and privileges that we hold, either unconsciously or consciously. The power is yours. I'd now like to bring up the results of the Mentimeter quickly and then I'll end my presentation. So we can see here that there's a wide range of scores that come in here. The average is about 30, which means that some people hold um, privileges, but also are underprivileged in some ways. We can also see that there are some people who are right at the end, the zero, and the majority of people fall on this side of the average. So within this room here, right now today, we can see that we as an industry hold power and privilege. How does this impact how you map and what you miss? Thank you.